Hi, it's Todd here with another non-fundraising film for Arrows vs Armour 2. This time hanging out with Will Sherman, Fletcher. We talk Arrows, I watch him forge bodkins. It's a good film, but we couldn't remove all of the references to Kickstarter and fundraising out of it and still leave a good film. So here it is today, but ignore all pleas for fundraising. Don't bother going to the page. We've got all the money we want for the main film and, well, and for the stretch goal films. Don't worry about it. We are sorted. Lean back, watch the film and ignore it when I go on about fundraising. Anyway, thank you. Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today I'm with Will Sherman from Medieval Arrows in his forge. Hi everybody. And he is going to be showing us step by step today how to forge Type 9 bodkins. The sort of things that, well, we believe penetrated armour at battles like Agincourt. And they're exactly the same kind that we used on our Arrows vs Armour myth busting film we did about three years ago. And the team is back because this time we're going to be doing the helmet, the visor, the neck defences, breastplate. If we've got the the money, the time, we're going to be doing the arm. Lucky shots from the side, can we get them in under the armpit, through the mail? All of these questions that we weren't able to answer in the first film. So I'm here for two reasons. Well, one is to catch up because it's always great to see you and, and to watch you work. And the other is to film you making these type nines. Yeah. So what I'd like to do, because we've got a lot to talk about with this upcoming film, is you forge one, maybe even forge a second. We'll just chat through as we go and then I'll shut up and we just watch you do the whole process, beginning to end, just working your way through. Okay. Sound like a plan? Perfect. Okay. Start going, what we got? So we've got a piece of raw iron in here. We're using iron for all of the heads. I'm gonna turn that into the arrowhead that you're holding at the moment. Lovely. So, so type nine, so it's what most people would call a plate cutting arrowhead. Yeah. So the first thing is flattening out for the socket. Yeah. So there's our socket kind of template, yeah. as it Can were. Can see how thick it is? Yeah, so on the ends here, I mean, that's, that's well under a millimetre. So yeah. oh, one thirty second if you're, you know, in the imperial system. But yeah, any thicker than that and you're going to have a really thick, heavy wall yeah. and it's not very nice to look at. So I suppose as an Arrowsmith, one thing that I notice here is your range of tools is much more limited than a full blacksmith's form. Yeah, very small amount of tools to actually use. Yeah. We've got the hammer, we've got the anvil, we've got a mandrel for rolling that socket up, and a cut-off hardy for taking the head off the bar, and that's it. Nothing yeah. else involved at all, yeah. And, and so, I mean, I'm looking around, blacksmith's forge, there's racks of tongs. And I mean, you've yeah. got some behind you, but not many. Yeah. And, and that's because you're working from the full bar? Yeah, and the only, the only tongs that I need are for holding the socket when the bar's been cut off. Um, and then there's nothing else to, to need, really, yeah. You know, it's, other people's workshops are always fascinating. So, what are you up to? So I'm going to roll that up now. You're actually, for such a thin thing, you're striking much harder than I'd expect. It's interesting. I think that's probably one of the things you've learned over the years, actually judging this, is how much you can give it to make your job fast. Because I'd be doing this now a lot slower than you would. Yeah, I've made a few of them at this point. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, we've rolled it up. Yeah. That will then be refined, and that will just be made to the diameter of the socket that I want, and just made it round. Yeah. But you've got a socket there ready to go now. Yeah. So I guess you've got to be pretty careful here because it's not going to take much to burn that. No, very thin, millimetre thick socket wall there. Yeah. That will melt very quickly, yeah. yeah. So what I'll do now is I'll refine the neck area mm -hmm. between the head itself and the socket. Make it look pretty. So 
you just sort of closing up the gaps a little bit there as well as neatening? Yeah, so I'm, I'm refining that area between the bar itself and the socket, uh -huh. tapering it in yeah. and getting rid of all of the gaps, all of the holes. And now I can refine that socket and make it look nice and neat. Yeah. It's funny how it goes, because I was looking at some Roman arrowheads um, uh, a week or two ago, and they don't close the sockets very right. often. They just have an open split down the side. So it's kind of, I don't know, it's a medieval thing to close the socket like this, but it's not actually required. So you've got, you know, a slightly rough socket there. Yep. Next stage? Next stage is to make it like that one is, nice and perfectly round, mm -hmm. and make sure that the diameter of the socket is what I want it to be for the arrowhead. Yeah. And we're making a copy of um, this arrowhead here. <laughs> A5698, uh -huh. and that has a socket of 11 millimetres. Okay. So we'll take it to exactly that. Lovely. And that's from where? Museum of London? Museum of London, yeah. Okay. Now it's interesting you watching you do the sockets actually because the thing is when you look at an arrowhead from the outside, nice neat socket, lovely, but actually the important point when I'm mounting it on a crossbow bolt or an arrow is what's going on on the inside. Yep. And the outside is pretty, the inside is functional. And I find that I really like your heads actually because they're very even inside, the socket's very even, it makes it easy to mount them, basically. Yeah, the benefit I've got as a Fletcher and Arrowsmith is that I make my heads for my own arrows. Yeah, yeah. So I fit them myself. So you know if you're doing a good job. I can't be bothered to deal with messy arrow heads and kind of off-center things. So I make them as neat as I can, because yeah. I know that for myself, it saves time fitting them to arrows. Okay, so now we've got our, our nice round socket. Yeah. I'm gonna cut that off now, off the bar. Uh -huh. Turn it around and work the point. Okay. Cool, nothing's changed there for 2,000 years, has it? <laughs> and I guess you're very careful to not disrupt the socket. At that point, stage. yeah. That's all been done, that's been set, the amateur's where I want it to be. Yeah. And does it happen there? I mean, everything happens. It shouldn't but... do. If it's out of the fire, you can see here that it's it's not being heated up. Yeah. We've got the area that we want hot, and yeah. the socket's uh, now being That is left. a well-controlled fire. <laughs> So when I put a point on it now, that's then a functional arrowhead. Yeah. I can go on an arrow shaft and it will go into something that it shot at. Well, I think actually if Joe shot that now, blunt or not, it would go into yeah. something. <laughs> So that's the basic form. Mm. We're not quite done yet. That, that's now a square cross section. Yep. We want it to be a diamond section. It's more efficient that way. So, I mean, again, I, you know, you've got 71 millimeters written there. Yeah. Now I know when I repeat a job, are you the same that basically you want to aim for 71 millimeters and you'll be 69 to 72 or something like that? Yeah. You're basically there every time with that measuring. Yeah. Do you even have a gauge or do you just... I do have a gauge when I'm doing a whole set of them. I'll have my caliper set up for the diameter of the socket and the length of the head to cut off. And I keep things fairly consistent. Yeah. So what, within a couple of grams maybe? Yeah, piece to piece? you'd hope so, yeah. And that's going from square to diamond now. Yeah, so that's now a diamond cross section. And now I'm just refining everything. I want my lines nice and tidy. Get rid of the hammer marks. Okay. 
I think that's probably there. Lovely stuff. So the end goal with that is to not need it to be on the grinder for half an hour because you're yeah. just wasting material and time. Yeah. That needs to be an almost functional arrowhead with a bit of sharpening. Yeah. So that's why, well, that's why you go to the effort of tidying up the lines and everything yeah. else. But so, you know, obviously we use electrical grinders these days because why not? Yeah. Um, but essentially that's the point that a medieval smith would have got it to. Yeah. And from there on, it would have been the grindstones over to the, the or even a file That could be filed sharp now. Yeah. If the faces are flat and the hammer lines are clean, you can follow that with a good file and you've got a sharp Job's arrowhead. Done. So that is arrowhead number one, finished. Yeah. Lovely. 39 more to go. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> For your orders, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'd love to ask you about sort of efficiency and mass production and, and just sort of, well, really how these things were made because I can see from the way you move around your tools and your, and your space, you know what you're doing. But historically, do we know how many arrowheads somebody was required to make? Yeah, we've got a record from St. Breville's where they were asked to make 100 qu uh, quarrel heads in one day. And that's one arrowsmith or a team of arrowsmiths making nothing else but quarrel yeah. heads. They wouldn't have been fitting them onto the, the bolts. They wouldn't have been putting the feathers on yeah. the veins. Fletcher's they would job. have just done the heads all day long. That's all yeah. they would have done. So, I mean, that's quite a haul. So any individual guy, that's 600 heads after a week. Yeah. Um, and that's quite a bucket of, of heads. You I'd like to get that now. much done in a week, yeah. But it is interesting because we think of the medieval world as being a, a time of of craft and individual quality and pride in your work, not of mass production, but yeah. that's absolute, absolutely what's required of war. You know, the munitions, the quantity you have to take. Yeah, they, they had quality control. We know that from records. People were sending back arrows and arrowheads because they weren't meeting quality standards. Because you were telling me oh, a while back now that they had like a pattern arrowhead that they'd send out to a, a workshop and say, yeah. copy this. Yeah, we know that at some point an, an iron arrowhead was made as a pattern and the arrowsmiths had to meet that pattern. So you are talking about hundreds of thousands of heads being made. At some point, the, the boundary between perfect, identical arrowheads had to become hundreds of thousands of arrowheads being made. But it is absolutely a time of mass production. Yeah. Um, and had to be. I mean, it's my understanding as well that um, working hours followed the daylight. Yeah. So it means that it's easier to fulfill your orders in the summer than it is in the winter, which is always yeah. kind of weird because it's so different to our modern world. You know, the where lights we... on and away you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in my case, I'm a cutler in the modern use of the word. I make knives. But historically, a cutler was the person who put them together. And a bladesmith would make that and somebody else would do the hilt work and somebody else did the engraving and the leather work. Same with you. Yeah, so in the 15th century, I wouldn't be making an arrowhead and then turning a shaft and then adding feathers and then fitting the arrowhead to the shaft. I'd be making arrowheads to a pattern all day long. Mm. That's all I'd be it. doing. That's all I'd be doing, yeah. Yeah, life's got more interesting since then. <laughs> yeah, I prefer doing all of it than, yeah. than the one thing. Uh, yeah. Same. Well, now I can make everything. Isn't that a privilege? You know, in a way that people couldn't then. They weren't allowed to. Yeah, exactly. The guild would create um, separate guilds for different people and different crafts mm. and they would control who was allowed to do what and what was common information. And then within those guilds, you'd have hierarchies and you'd have, you know, one guild controlling one item and that would be it. Out of interest, do you think that you would have one workshop specialising in bodkins and another workshop specialising in bladed arrowheads? I don't know. And that would be a really interesting thing to find out because they are very different. That Once you've made the socket, you can kind of do whatever you want to the end of it. But if you cut that socket off to, to weld a blade to it, that's a very different process to turning this mm. round and making a point out and of it. And different level of skill. Very different level of skill, yeah. And even within that, you have maybe apprentices brazing the barbs on. Yeah, because sometimes welded, sometimes brazed. Yeah, we've got records of both. And brazing is a lot easier, but it takes a bit longer, and they're not as strong. Mm. So the higher level smith may well be fire welding those blades on, and the lower level smith will be brazing them on. And that's within a separate entity to someone just turning it around and drawing out a point. By the time of campaign, when you're having to make hundreds of thousands of arrowheads, they may have even turned workshops into specific arrowsmithing stations. Oh, uh, sort of like a bit like the Second World War or something where bicycle factories got turned into machine guns. Exactly, yeah. Companies. And then in times of peace, the smith may have minimised his workforce and they were just making arrowheads to a pattern. Well, thanks, Will. It's always, always great chatting to you. But what I'd really like to see now is make me another one. And I won't say a word. I just watch the process go through. Okay, let's do it. Thanks.
I hope you enjoyed that one with Will and I just hanging out. But remember, when I say we're fundraising, go to the Kickstarter page, we're not. We're not. We have enough money for what we want to do now. So I hope you've enjoyed the film. I'll see you again another time. But thank you once more. You have been amazing. Thank <laughs> you.